I did not structure the story, how the story unfolds in the traditional um, European way of telling uh, the tall tale, once upon a time, and then the story unfolds. Uh, what I did instead was to create a new structure that I call my griot structure, and the way uh, the story is told in the way an African griot would recall and recount a family's history. Now, if you know anything about African griots, you know there's this special clan of people and they are hired to come in to, uh, you know, wedding ceremonies, birthing ceremonies, funeral ceremonies, naming ceremonies, and they recall and recount a family's history over a period of days. And all of this is in the griot's head. That's their, that's their position in the community to recall and recount family histories. So it kind of like unfur unfurls in a way that is not structurally similar to um, European storytelling. What they got out there, Eddie Wyola? Life, child, the beginning of a new life. Just because we cross over to the mainland, it doesn't mean we don't love you. How you can leave the soil? The soil. Because we from the sea. We came here in chains. When they go down in the water, they ain't never come. 25th anniversary, yeah. but it's recently been restored. It's Daughters of the Dust has been um, picked up by Cohen Media, Co the Cohen Collection, and it's been restored and digitized and uh, color corrected once again. And they're releasing it as a theatrical in November of 2016. That's fantastic. As a re-release, yeah. And you're mm -hmm. in the National Registry, right? In 2004, uh, the National Film Registry um, contacted me and said, yes, we've, uh, it's been inducted into the National Registry. And so I'm the first African-American woman to be in the registry. Definitely an important film. Now, yeah. I mean, but how, how is this restoration different than other versions that we've seen? Well, um, the restoration is different because we were working uh, with celluloid film uh, for the, its initial original release. And because it's so expensive to go from answer print to answer print, we were like at our second answer print maybe, and we just couldn't go any further because each answer print costs about $20,000. So we never really had a release print. We were, we've been screen, screening, even the DVD was considered uh, an answer print. Now it's a release print because digitally it could just be dialed in and it's not the same cost. Right. And so now uh, the images of Daughters of the Dust look like what it looked like when we were editing the work print. It never looked as good as the work print when it was being projected in the theaters. So what, what I mean, I know you sat in on the timing and all that stuff, but mm. what was it like when you saw the whole thing? projected with the audience for the first time? I saw that at the, um, in California at the uh, Wyla Theater. You could see into the eyes of the characters once again, and it, it's, it's, the colors are robust, and, uh, and it, it really looks good. Right, so mm -hmm. what, for people who either saw it before or haven't had a chance to see it, obviously it's a landmark. You know, you mm -hmm. it didn't, doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't need the National Registry mm -hmm. to validate it. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus in making that film? Oh, wow. Um, I'll, there were a lot of different things. Um, I guess the first, the overriding intention on making Daughters of the Dust was to make a film about um, an African-American family at the turn of the century an African-American family whose who the adults were the first freeborn adults, not born enslaved, to take a look to see what decisions, what choices they would be making 
at the turn of the century because the story is set in 1902. Um, and it was also, uh, I wanted to take a look at um, retention patterns, and we talked about that briefly before, how retention patterns pers have persisted and continue to persist uh, since the time of the forced migration. Uh, the, the retention patterns persist in terms of language, the Creolized language of the Gullah uh, language, the, uh, the food, Afro-Atlantic foodways, religions, motor habits, um, sensibilities, aesthetic sensibilities. Um, and I wanted to see those things on film. Um, although those things had been denied us before uh, because uh, the filmmakers, the writers, the uh, DPs, the production designers, People don't understand that it was, it was most of the films that were done about the South were, had been Europeanized, so to speak. Uh, they didn't go deep into the culture. There were layers and layers of, of Hollywood films that, you know, impacted upon one another. And so we decided to do di something different. And one of the things that we decided to do differently was use the... Um, the symbolism and, and the, uh, the color as a metaphor. And we use the color indigo because that was one of the main cash crops for uh, that region and for the United States too, and for the colonies. And so um, uh, the, the, the main colors were, the themes were indigo and, the, and we see the, in flashbacks, we see the indigo processing plants that were on the um, plantations and it was a very poisonous process and we also see the elders in the family who worked um, enslaved their hands are like permanently stained blue from the uh, from the indigo dyes um, so anyway that was what that was the main theme that went throughout so it was just the color the the physicality, the, uh, the locations, and of course, the language. We brought in a um, Gullah consultant, Ron Days, to, uh, who eventually went on to produce Gullah Gullah Island. So Ron Days was our uh, Gullah consultant, and also uh, Verda Mae Grosvenor was our uh, Gullah consultant. And she was born in that region, in the Yamasee region, but then she also grew up, you know, in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And you, but you use Tommy Hicks, he's sort of like your entry point for... Tommy Hicks is uh, the Philadelphia Negro. <laughs> he, his character is someone that, that I could see functioning with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in the Niagara movement. And he's a photographer who travels from Philadelphia down to, back down to the Sea Islands with uh, cousin Auntie Viola to photograph the family's um, progress, moving away from the backwoods to the north, their migration north. Um, and so he brings, you know, technology with him, of course, because, uh, for, for two reasons. One, because he's, sh he's a show off. And number two is because, uh, you know, to document the family's crossing. So the first piece of technology he, he has with him is a, um, a kaleidoscope for the children. Um, and which he explains, you know, Carlos, Eidos, you know, he's, he gets into his educated background and explaining that to Yellow Mary and Trula who just kind of look at him and laugh like, buddy, we already know these things. You're not, you know, you're not impressing us. And then later he's photographing the family and the children on the beach and he uses his photo flash powder. Now, if you're familiar with a lot of those old Tarzan movies and whatever, one of the first things they always do when, you know, like, uh, the, the white uh, ex explorers come into an African village. There's, they'd float, throw some flour or something into the, uh, the into the fire campfire, and it would blow up, and all the natives would go running. So he has flash powder, and he uses, takes his picture and uses flash powder. Now all of the photographers out there 
you know, I figured they would get it, but a lot of them still don't get it. But a lot, when, when the flash goes off, it's like, wait a minute, he's on the beach, it's daylight, he does not <laughs> need flash powder. But that adds to the, to the whole performance. Mm -hmm. You know, I bring magic, you know, poof, <laughs> you know. I need to know that I can come and hold on to what I come from. A pass on us that think you can cross over to the mainland and run away from it. Never forget who we is and how far we done come. My name is Julie Dash, and you're watching Real Black. One of the most common mistakes that independent filmmakers make is feeling like your picture is finished when you lock picture. You focus on actors, cinematography, the writing. People spend 10 years on a screenplay. They, it's a labor of love. They get the financing. They lock picture, they finish it, and then they expect to hand it off to someone. And as independent filmmakers in 2010, that's not where it ends. You need to be able to market and understand the distribution of your film. Are we doing Wizard of Oz analogies? Are we really doing this? Go for it. But I mean, <laughs> what they have. What they had before was just fine, and it, they had their own stories, their own way of telling its stories, and each other. And that worked on the yellow brick road to freedom. 